Hi, Louise. Okay, I tried to join in a different way, so I'm hoping that will work. Uh, I should go back to trying to share my screen. You do sound clearer now, so hopefully that will work fine. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure where what people heard or not heard. Um, I'll basically this slide was just set showing that a lot of interest, um, a lot of parental support and valuing of science, positive views of scientists, but all of these are not translating through into young people feeling it's something that they could be in the future. So we're interested in what causes this, what we call being doing divide, where young people are finding science interesting, they've got positive views of it, but this doesn't translate into seeing it as something that could be for me. And although this looks like it bubbles around a bit, it's actually statistically, um, uh, there's no st differences between the proportion of young people age 10 versus at age 18, who um, are interested in becoming a scientist. And that's interesting in itself, because you would have thought, given all, particularly given all these positive views, that maybe um, young people would be much more feeling that the world's their oyster. You know, why, why, why is this so small, this percentage? And if we look at who aspires to be a scientist, that becomes uh, more narrow over time. So narrows in terms of gender and class and ethnicity. So we wanted to try and unpick these patterns. Hang on, I'm not screen sharing, am I? Um, there we go. So um, our, we've got a, a report from, from the first two phases of the project from 10 to 19, which is really showing that there are lots of interconnecting factors that shape that uh, perception that science isn't for me. And social injustices, what we do in school science, popular representation sites, they all play a part, and so does the role of science capital. And there's just a link there to the report if you uh, want to see it. And this diagram really tries to bring together all of the factors that we mapped out as shaping um, what, what shapes a young person's sense of feeling that they're a science person and recognised by others as, as that and wanting to continue with it in the future. So as you can see from this diagram, if nothing else, it's saying it is all complex. There's not one thing that determines it. There's all these different interconnecting factors. So I'm going to talk a bit today about the science capital one, but also just recognising that this sits within lots of other things. It does matter how we represent science, this green one. It does matter what we're doing in schools and how young people are encountering science. So the idea of science capital we developed in the Aspires project and we extended it since through other research projects as well. And it's really just a concept, a way of bringing together all the science related stuff that you have in your life, a bit like a bag or a holder. So it, it contains, as you can see in the picture there, sort of aspects of what you know, how you think about science, what you do in your spare time and who you know. And we found that students whose science capital is valued and supported and recognised are significantly more likely to aspire to and to participate in post-16 science and to see themselves and to be seen by others as having a science identity. So as I said, you can think, if you're using the bag metaphor, you can think about science capital as kind of in containing these four pockets. There's your science literacy, what you know about science, your attitudes and values. So for example, do you think of science as being everywhere um, or not? You're out of school behaviours if you're a young person. So what sort of science related stuff do you do in your spare time? Are you looking it up on the internet or um, going to a science museum and so on? And then there's science at home. So who you know? So are you being significantly encouraged by a key adult over time to consider science? Are you talking about it um, with your friends and family uh, in your spare time? And these different combinations of science capital play out differently across different families and they help create this sense of whether science is for people like me or not. So there's two quotes there from a mum and a student um, from separate families who are from very uh, sciencey families. So you can see there the mum saying the other day in the car we were laughing about chemical symbols and things. Um, Davina says science is just where it's at in my family and she talked about them wearing their science t-shirts, sitting around the dinner table, talking about what they've read in New Scientist. So for them, science is um, not just a subject, it's part of who we are and what we do in our everyday lives. But statistically in our sample, they're very much the minority. So about, um, about 5% of 11 to 15 year olds would fit that pattern. 
The majority were more like the mum and Jack, the student, um, in the second two quotes. The mum saying, you know, in, I suppose in everyday life you don't get that much to do with science. We don't see it, uh, whereas Davina and the mum cited above um, would see it uh, in, in the acoustics, in the sound, biology, in your body, it's everywhere. M many of them felt it was distant and abstract, whereas Jack said, my family, they never talk about science. So families make a difference, but schools also make a big difference. So schools and teachers really shape the extent to which young people's science capital could be uh, realised and leveraged or valued or not in the classroom. And we had examples in our data of even some young people who had quite extensive science capital, that this could be kind of squashed down by school science. So, um, for example, we uh, Vanessa is a young woman from a black African background. Her dad had a, a science related um, uh, degree qualification from his home country. They were really supportive of science. The family would buy her science kits, talk about science, encourage it. But it, all of this wasn't enough for her um, experiences in the school system, which kind of constantly told her through these little messages that you're not good enough, that this isn't for you. Um, people like you don't do science. And in the end, she didn't continue with science. Although she loved the subject, she talked about how obviously my love for it just wasn't enough. Kate as well, um, really liked physics, did incredibly well in physics. Um, but when I interviewed her at age 18 about which degree she might take, she said, well, you know, I like physics, but it's too hard. That's not for me. I couldn't do that. It would just be too hard. Now she got A stars in physics as, as in every other subject she did. So I said, well, if it's too hard for you, who on earth can do it? But there, this sort of links to these representations of science, particularly in areas like physics, which can feel very exclusionary and can work to um, encourage young people to self-exclude themselves as well. So what can we do? Well, we've got two tools that I'd like to try and um, talk through briefly. So they work together and they're based on the idea that it's not just what you do, but the way that, and the reasons that you do it. So it's the values and the mindset that underpin uh, whether we're trying to teach science or do outreach work. Uh, that really shape the potential of what we're doing. So the tools are based on the idea of reflecting and then acting. So I'm going to talk first about the equity compass as a tool to help us reflect and adopt a social justice mindset. And then the science capital teaching approach as um, techniques that we can use to put these ideas into action uh, in classrooms or outreach settings. So the Equity Compass is a tool that we developed in the Youth Equity and STEM project. Uh, it's a five year project that was funded by Welcome and the NSF uh, together with the SRC. And it, we developed it in response to the practitioners we were working about. We're saying, well, you, you're talking about equity and social justice but we, and talking about taking that mindset to our work. But what does that mean? How do we do it? How would we practically know we're doing it? So the Equity Compass is really a conceptual tool to help orientate us towards what um, gets some key dimensions of equity and social justice. So it's a reflective tool. There's a set of requ reflective questions associated with each dimension that can try and guide our thinking. And we can also map progress on it. So the idea is at the centre of the compass, it's less equitable. And what we're trying to do is move ever outwards, um, can always keep going, uh, in relation to these different four areas, which I'll just uh, talk through. And you can also plot your, um, where you are on it to see are there dimensions I haven't considered and over time I can plot myself again and see that I'm trying to move outwards. So there are four main areas. The first area is what we call challenging the status quo. So this is a set of three sub areas that help us think about how are we really, how is our practice transforming power relations? Are we actually reproducing what's there already or are we transforming it? To what extent is our practice driven by, for example, uh, the interests and needs of dominant communities or industry or the science STEM sector? Or to what extent is it actually being driven by the interests, values and needs of minoritised communities? And also, to what extent are we really reinforcing privilege? So are we giving more science to those who have already got lots of science? Or are we being more re redistributive? So are we giving differentially according to, um, to, to need? So the second area is helping us think about how we're working with and valuing minoritized and excluded or um, 
disadvantaged communities. So here we're trying to think about working in more participatory ways. So are we doing science to young people? Are we doing it for them or are we doing it with them? And tied to this is the idea of are we taking an assets based approach? So it's what we're doing based on the idea that the young people we're working with kind of lack something that they're lacking knowledge, aspiration, interest or motivation. Or are we valuing what they're bringing with them already and really valuing and working with that in an assets based approach? So the third area of the compass helps us think about how to embed equity. So here we're really thinking about the extent to which it's mainstreamed or not. So sometimes if we're in the centre here, our efforts might be a little bit tokenistic or um, it, that's so-and-so's job to do equity. It's not threaded through everything that we're doing. Uh, whereas what we're trying to do is move to a situation where equity is everyone's job, it's core in everything we do. It's not separate from the science. It's, it's absolutely embedded, running through like a stick of rock. And the fourth and final area is helping us think about how we then extend that equity work further. So really thinking about, are we working in a short-term way or a long-term way? So there are lots of nice interventions and experiences that people have, but how do these actually support um, uh, people over the long term? How do, they, how do we get to extend this work? And are we really focusing just on individuals or are we orientating this work more broadly? How does it spread through into communities and society more, more at large? So uh, this is missing a quote, but this was going to be a quote from one of our uh, practitioners. Um, this must be the wrong version of my talk. Um, which would have said uh, how they've been working and what sort of impact they felt it had. But I'll skip on to a quote which is there from our teachers. So we've worked, we've used the equity compass both with um, informal science learning practitioners in zoos, science centres and um, STEM clubs and so on. And we've also developed a version for use with schools and teachers. So you can see there a quote from our primary teacher was saying, you know, I was surprised what a difference could be made by such a small thing. So she, you know, if you use the compass and reflect and then just tweak your practice, she was seeing the pleasure on the faces. This is in relation to uh, taking a more assets based approach in her classroom. Secondary teachers have also used it to reflect on the way that they're representing science and also some were thinking about the differential differential access to science enrichment so sometimes the science uh, trips and things tend to be given to those in the top set or those on the triple science courses and actually thinking well is that the most equitable version why is this not being opened up to everyone what kind of messages is that uh, sending about who science is for who gets valued so there's some links here to um, our various guides if you're interested um, We've got different versions, as I said, for informal practitioners, teachers, leaders and governors, and we've got one coming soon for funders as well. So the, the, science, uh, the equity compass helps us reflect and take that social justice mindset to our practice. And then we've also um, developed the um, two handbooks, and this is the primary one that's shown there, one for primary, one for secondary, on how you use these ideas and embed them actually in everyday science teaching. So we've done this through the science capital teaching approach and it's really based on that idea of trying to change practice rather than trying to change the child. So this is both based on a, a social justice ideal but also it's a sustainable way to help make a difference because it's the everyday practice that's so powerful and if we can change that that's going to help reach every child rather than just focusing interventions on individual uh, children. So in line with the compass, it's about adapt, adapting practice differentially according to need and really trying to focus on the way that we're, our practices often unwittingly can reproduce the sorts of injustices that we want to challenge. So um, I'm going to talk particularly about the primary approach because that's the one that we've just um, launched recently, but that builds and extends on work that we did previously over four years from teachers in four cities in relation to secondary. And the new primary project, and there's a few of our primary teachers there, has been developed over the last two years uh, with partner teachers uh, from the PSTT and Ogden Trust. And I have to say they were absolutely fantastic because obviously they were trying to develop, uh, co-develop and implement this approach over 
uh, against the backdrop of the global pandemic and the shift to lockdown learning. So it's been, um, I just want to, you know, praise them for their incredible uh, resilience and uh, tenacity uh, and uh, persisting with this against incredibly difficult contexts. So the science capital teaching approach is really trying to give us a way to understand why some children engage and connect with science and others do not. And again, like the compass, it's a reflective approach. And very much what we've tried to do in the primary version is, is um, emphasise the ways that it, it can be most effective when it's developed through a whole school approach, so a whole school framework that connects that. So the approach builds on good existing teaching practice. And you can see in this diagram here, hopefully at the bottom, it sits on this bedrock. And the bedrock is good teaching practice or good um, educational practice in whatever sector you work in. And it, so some of this should hopefully be familiar. It's trying not to reinvent the wheel. It then sits on a foundation that I'll talk through in a minute and some pillars of practice. And the idea is this all takes part in this reflective um, uh, model where you reflect and then tweak. So we were trying to come up with something really pragmatic, something that can work with any curriculum. And as I said, it's trying to advocate for this whole school approach. So as I said, the bedrock is good science education practice. On top of that, we have the foundation, which is really about broadening what and who counts in science. So the idea here is, it's not just that students can find science concepts difficult or struggle to learn them, they can actually um, find it difficult to identify with, engage with science as a whole. For a lot of young people, it can feel really distant and quite alien. And it's really here about trying to challenge those dominant stereotypes and ideas of what counts as doing science. Is science about getting the answer right and putting your hand up? Or is it about asking questions and being curious and that everyone has something to offer and say in it? So we're really trying to get that away from that very pernicious idea that we found in the Aspires project to be really prevalent, that science is only for clever students. And we know that cleverness is very much often a racialized, class and gendered idea that excludes some people, even when they're attaining really highly. So our teachers were reflecting on the, the sorts of behaviours that they thought were being valued in their classrooms. And there are three key elements to the foundation. So the first is about that really learner centric, child centred approach um, to teaching and learning. So starting with the child, but very much weaving in that equity angle of valuing who they are, working with what they bring, not seeing them as lacking and um, uh, sort of empty vessels to be filled up with science knowledge. The second area is really about fostering inclusive teaching and learning. So that idea of how do we include everyone? How do we value everyone? How do we make sure the sorts of representation that we're using in science are not narrow and exclusionary? And, and how do we support everyone to have a voice within the class? And then the third aspect is really seeing science learning as not just to provide more scientists for the future, but really as fundamentally about supporting young people's voice and agency. So really thinking about how young people can not just know science, but identify with it and use it and use it in their lives uh, to, to, um, to, to achieve things that are important to them and their communities. So from the foundation, we then have three pillars, which are kind of techniques to help realise that foundation. So the first is where our, our teachers are personalising and localising the science content to their particular class. So all of our teachers are already, already brilliant at contextualising science, but in this respect, they're really tailoring it in that very personal and local way to the particular students in that class. So in this respect, the approach looked different in every classroom because all the students are different. And you can see a quote there from a, a science teacher saying that they found that when the young people could express themselves and their ideas, they were much more engaged and valued. And you could see it when they connect. And a lot of our teachers talked about that sort of what they call a light bulb moment or a meerkat moment, where the young people would suddenly sit up and you could just see that point of personal connection with the content. The second pillar is about how you uh, meaningfully elicit value, link and extend. So this again, thinking about back to the compass, is really about taking that assets based approach, really valuing starting with what young people bring with them and then linking that to science. So 
valuing what they already know. There's often things they've experienced that they can then bring to it. So that idea, as one young person said when their teacher had been using the approach, now everyone has something to say, not just the people who know the traditional science knowledge. And the third pillar is really specifically thinking about how we build science capital. So this is thinking about some of those dimensions. So support using often um, teachers were sort of drip feeding it into their classes or using homeworks as well to really um, get them engaging more with science media, conveying those messages about the transferability of science, because from our Aspire's work, we know that the vast majority of young people and their parents think the only point of learning science is to become a science teacher, a doctor um, or a scientist. And actually what the teachers are trying to embed in is science, science knowledge and skills are useful for everything in life, any career, your everyday living, making decisions about your health and the environment. So really just making that relevance of science really, really, really key and trying to foster as well um, discussions at home and making science more part of everyday life. So the impact of the approach, um, there's an infographic on the left hand side from secondary and some um, stats on the right hand side from primary. But overall, what we were finding was that um, the approach was supporting building science capital. It was building engagement. Young people were much more likely at the end of the year to see the relevance of science to their own everyday lives. Um, were taking part in more sorts of science activities off their own back in their spare time and feeling more engaged with the lessons. And from the primary one, you can also see that our teachers as well felt that they would got a lot out of being in the project and thankfully would recommend the approach to others. Uh, just a couple of quotes. Uh, our year four teacher here was quite honest saying, you know, they, she was sceptical to start with, but when she used the approach, she saw it made a huge difference and it changed that classroom experience. So just doing these sort of simple little tweaks could lead to quite big differences. Um, and a quote there from one of our teachers uh, saying that in the top 10 years of teaching, it's the only thing that's really, really made her reevaluate her practice. So just to conclude and hopefully leaving some time for discussion, I think what we're trying to say in our work is that there's this importance of really intentionally foregrounding issues of equity and social justice. So really making them front and centre in everything we do. And the reason we think that's so important is because by not doing it isn't neutral. Not foregrounding equity actually leads to the reproduction of inequalities. So this is why we think it's really important to say that it's not over there in equity corner, but it's really key to everything we do about how we teach science, how we do science outreach and so on. So as hopefully I've conveyed, it's, for us, it's about um, that values and mindset, which are really important. We see critical reflection as so powerful here, um, and it can change such a lot for young people in their, in their experiences of science. So within that, there's this idea of changing practice rather than changing learners. I think so many of the interventions we've had to date are always trying to change young people. And actually, if we change how science is represented, taught and experienced, this is much more powerful, it's much more sustainable. And these small differences can make a difference, but they do need to be incorporated uh, into standard practice and not to be these kind of one-offs. One-offs need to connect up more. And it's they, if they have no connection to what you're experiencing in the everyday classroom, it can be very limiting to the amount of change we, we can bring about. So really what we're trying to do here is say, let's shift from thinking about science as the destination to, use, to really thinking about science as the vehicle. So science, the value of science education can be a vehicle for supporting young peoples and communities, or voice, agency, active citizenship, and so, and so on. Yes, the pipeline is important, but I think actually for us, it's more important to um, also have this agenda where it's actually for active citizenship for everyone. And by doing so, that can actually help more young people to keep their options open for longer. So, as we say, this idea of supporting critical STEM agency uh, is really useful and valuable in that respect. There's, you're welcome to have a copy of the slides, um, there's our contact details and resources if you want them, and I shall finish there and uh, look forward to some discussion. I can work out how to stop sharing. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thanks for those insights. I think it's a really useful overview of the science capital approach. And there's lots of lessons, I think, that we can take away also from an outreach point of view. Um, 
we're going to open up to questions now from the audience um so just as a reminder of what i what i said previously if you would like to ask a question you can either do that by using the raise hand function so if you look to the bottom of your screen there should be a button that says um reactions and one of those options is to raise hand and i can then unmute you and you can ask your question directly or if you would prefer not to appear on the recording, then please type your message in the chat and I can read it out for you on your behalf. Um, we have already got a couple of messages come in. Um, so I'll, I'll just pose those to you now, Louise. We had one from Sarah in the chat who said, do you know how many schools are already using this approach? Oh, good question. Um, I should know off the top of my head. Quite a few schools uh, in England, so that's very in, imprecise, isn't it? Um, I mean, we know it's been used in about um, about 80 countries the resources have been downloaded in. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that it's being absolutely fully used, but um, we've obviously got schools who've taken part from primary and secondary, but we've also been doing lots of training approaches. Um, we worked with the Institute of Physics. Um, and so... I never quite know how many uh, people don't always tell us, uh, but I believe quite a lot of schools now are, are hopeful, but I believe are, are using it. But we should try I've, I've seen some comments in the chat as well saying that um, that people are hearing it more about primary teachers using it specifically. So, yeah, I think it's getting out there. We're about to start um, a new course of training trainers, uh, regional trainers for primary. So I'm hoping in two years time it will be uh, even more out there. Um, also in the chat, Ruth asked, uh, well, she said thank you, first of all, for the talk and asked um, if that we know from a person's experience in childhood that it can impact their decisions in adulthood. Have you done any work to apply the uh, um, equity compass with adult learners? And if not, are there any opportunities to explore this with you? Yes, thank you. Great. So we've... Um, so some of the um, informal science learning practitioners we work with, so we've been working particularly with some uh, practitioners in Ireland recently, they work with, uh, many of them work with adults, so they've been using the compass with the people they do outreach work with. Um, and we're also now exploring maybe doing a higher education version, so for work with um, students as well. So we've got schools version, but I think it's just, it's always helpful to tweak the language um, uh, to, to make it most relevant with the example so we, yeah we'll be interested in that if anyone's uh, working with students and wants to get involved and maybe do a case study for us for the next version then let us know uh, there's another chat uh, from Dani. um she says are there any plans to implement these methods um in, on a national level to ensure that all uk school teachers are involved yeah, great. Thank you. Good question. So what we're trying to do um, with the primary is exactly that. So we've got um, a year now where we've got uh, regional, they've just been, um, I think we've just selected the regional representatives for who, coordinators who cover, professional development coordinators who cover particular regions. And we'll work with them and kind of train the trainers model. And then they'll cascade that within their regions to science leads so that what because what we want is that more sustainable model where there is someone that you, you can get your local training from so you don't just have to read the handbook and work out what to do yourself and someone to help support in each region so hopefully we'd get a nice national coverage there so we're doing that with primary and it would be nice to explore options of doing that in the future with secondary but um, we'll start with primary this year yeah, so work your way up. No, that sounds really good. Uh, we've also got a question from Caitlin who says, um, how are you looking forward to the future? Is there any further work or studies planned? Oh, thank you. Yes. So um, we're carrying on with our Aspires analysis at the moment. So we're currently doing um, analyses of the young people aged 21 to try and work out now. A lot of them are in work or they were in uh, university or net looking towards going into the labour market to try and work out, now we know where they've got to, what were the influences on their trajectories? And we're trying to do that more disciplinary. So like this week, I've been looking particularly at chemistry uh, routes and we're also going to be looking at maths and so on. Uh, so hopefully we'll get to biology as well. Um, and we also are doing, we've got two other projects um, uh, looking at out of school science settings. So we've also been looking at how do we use these sorts of tools and actual practice in contexts like maker spaces as well, both sort of, uh, which relate to digital and engineering um, uh, 
areas. <laughs> I think you touched on this next question a little bit in your talk um, when you thanked the, the teachers for their hard work, but um, there's a, another question here from Kayleen saying, how has the pandemic and the move towards online and digital public engagement affected the implementation of the science capital approach? Um, there are barriers and downsides to engagement being online, but it does mean events are open to a wider, more diverse range of people. Yeah, really good question. I mean, I think generally as we know the pandemic has exacerbated the existing inequalities in society already so there's been a particular need for this but um we found that the i mean we were very impressed with how well the teachers did manage to apply the pro approach shifting it to the online um delivery um and I, and I guess because it's it's a mindset that you apply to whatever the curriculum and the tasks you, you, you are that you're doing but um they they we were expecting them to just say, look, we're just desperately trying to cope with what we're doing, but they did manage to do it, which was really, really good and exciting. Um, and I think you're right that it has affordances and limitations. So we know how hard it's been for schools to get every child online and not every child, when they're online learning, they're not in the same context, they have different challenges. But equally, I think that idea of, um, particularly in our training, you know, not having to, when we worked with the teachers, they didn't all physically have to come to us anymore. It can be much more flexible and we can provide much more flexible support to them as well. Um, so yeah, affordances and limitations. But all our training now we're going to keep online because actually it does work really well and people are used to it now. And it just means that you don't have to take one whole day out for a two hour session. Yeah, it's definitely an advantage. In Especially, I think it makes it more inclusive if you if you're a carer or you've got children or just a busy work schedule. Yes, and I like one of the benefits. Children and pets in the background is always welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Makes it more interesting. I think Jackson's just tried to join us again, so um, hopefully he'll be able to ask his question now. Just while I wait for him to to get set up. Um, I wondered if I could ask you if there's uh, like just one single take home message that everyone should keep in mind when doing outreach and engagement work, what would that be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, who and why, who are you doing it for and why are you doing it? I think often we, particularly when we've been doing something for a long time, we kind of take for granted this must be a good thing. And so I think the one thing we do when we work with outreach people and with teachers is say, let's just stop. And reflect and think um, like using the compass like who whose interest is this in so um, I often give the example of um, uh, uh, Dr Bridges who's uh, one of the a professional engineer who goes into schools to give a talk about engineering so but it could be any any subject area and often we do often those things they, they're well meaning but they're done from the point of view of the reason I'm doing it is either because I want to get more kids into engineering or biology or because there's something really important about content knowledge that I want them to learn, like the bridges that are arched are stronger than flat bridges or, or whatever it is, the, the thing that you particularly care about as a specialist. Mm -hmm. And I think just stopping and thinking, why should they care? Why is this in their interest? What do they want from this? What can I offer them? And really shifting that focus, the, the idea of science as the vehicle, not the destination, or myself as a resource and not uh, someone who's trying to achieve something for me or my industry. And just that little tweak, it doesn't mean you don't do the thing you're going to do, but just doing it in that little way can make a huge amount of difference, both to the engagement and the outcomes. So that's a slightly long-winded answer, but stopping and thinking about who I'm doing it for and why. No, it's really interesting how that just small change in mindset can really affect the whole outcome of, of the event. Um, Dr Jackson, if you'd like to ask a question, would you, if you, you can hear, would you just raise your hands, use the raise hand button again, just so I know that you are available to ask your question. Um, and while we're waiting for that, there's a question here from Sharon, who says uh, she wanted to ask about universities. Are there any resources for that situation? She's been adapting science capital for higher education, which is why she's asking. Oh, that's interesting. Well, we, we should definitely talk further. Um, we haven't actually um, adapted the science capital teaching approach for higher education, but um, it would obviously fit. So that would be really interesting to consider further. I mean, as I said, with the compass, we're interested, we're trying to think about an HE version currently as well as to, to sit with that. So, yeah, it, that's an area I'd love to, love to uh, do some more work in. 
No, she said yes, absolutely. So <laughs> maybe you should pair up after this. Um, Dr. Jackson, we have um, unmuted you again, yes. so please try ask your question. Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible? Am I audible now? Yes, we can hear you now. Audible. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for the great initiative in passing this information to the educators. Uh, I I really agree, 100% agree with, uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Lucy, uh, that we need to relate with the practical aspects of science while we teach the students. Of course, I do teach in the university. This is our university. Uh, but my question is, will I be also able to join your team in this outreach program? Um, well, we we're not specifically doing an outreach program ourselves but we're all our resources are free to share and use so you're very welcome to to use any of them as as you wish uh, in in your in your teaching and your work in, in higher education 